Good afternoon and welcome back to another Unreal tutorial. In this video we'll be adding our obstacle class and this is going to be quite a simple class to implement so we're actually going to have a quick tidy up of the project alongside this. Now the first thing I wanted to mention is if we go to our blueprints folder uh, inside of here I've just misnamed the interface that we made uh, and I had noted that I wanted to call this the BPI underscore spawnable and I guess I must have just mistyped something and called it spawner which isn't very uh, descriptive because it's actually not being placed on any of the spawner objects it's specifically being made to be placed on an object which is able to be spawned so the spawnable objects so just so that, that makes more sense i'm going to rename that to be the bpi underscore spawnable uh, now of these things they're starting to get a little bit miscellaneous uh, it may not be necessary to have a folder for each of them but it will be nice to kind of clean the hierarchy up so I'm just going to go to the blueprints folder, create a new folder here, and the first one I'll just call misc. And this will be where we put the interface and our components. So we'll just place these in here. Um, and I also want to have something which is kind of like a folder specifically for game management. So I'm just going to create another folder and call this one game. And again, inside of here, I'm just going to place the level manager and the game mode. Uh, just because of things like this, we're not going to have multiple level managers, we're not going to have multiple game modes necessarily, uh, so it's maybe not going to be worthwhile having their own folder. But if we do create another class or structure kind of similar to that, then it should be able to be housed in this folder. Um, and that really just leaves the player here, which I'm quite happy with for now. Now the final thing, I'm just going to create a new folder, and this is going to be our obstacles folder. Now for this tutorial series, I only have one obstacle planned, but of course, as you've seen previously with inheritance and things, this should be fairly simple to create a base class for obstacles and have uh, a variety of different types with different functionalities. Uh, but I think I've kind of got that concept drawn in, so I'm going to leave that one and just create one very simple obstacle. Uh, but we're going to have a folder just in case you wanted to build upon this. So for the obstacle class, what we're going to do is we're going to use our standard actor class again. So we'll go blueprint classes, actor, and we'll call this one BP underscore obstacle. Okay, so for the obstacle class, uh, if we do the visual stuff first of all, what we want is a static mesh for the visual components. So I'm just going to create our static mesh. And of course, again, just for this, I'll be using the standard cube that we've been playing with. We're going to leave the default scene route so that we have somewhere to, uh, to house this as the origin. And then finally, we want our scrolling component again, because remember, we're not going to be rewriting that code. This is going to be moving in the same direction as everything else. So we can add components. We can find our BP underscore scrolling component and we'll just add this to the object. So again, now, as long as we set this up correctly, then we should just be able to spawn these into the world and we'll have the obstacles moving along as well. And the final thing we need to add to the class before actually implementing any logic will be the interface. So under class settings, we're just gonna go down to add the interface. And again, this is going to be our spawnable interface. So we'll find the BPI underscore spawnable. We'll add that and that will give us our interface functions that we'll need in just a moment. So to begin with some kind of logical approach to this, the first thing I want to do for the obstacles is to add a small amount of variety to the way that they spawn, and this is just going to be changing the scale of them. Now I'm going to do this in the construction script, because that will mean that every time we create or move a, an obstacle around, this will give us a kind of random uh, scale to the obstacles. And this is very simple to do. So all we want to do is get our static mesh. We'll pull this in. We will pull off of this and find the set world scale 3D function. And we're going to change one of these axes to be a random value. So I'm quite happy with the size and the X and the Y. I'm going to keep it this one by one. But what I do want to do is make it taller. So back in the construction script, all we're going to do is we'll split the scale of this act. And I'm going to change the Z axis to be, uh, or the Z scale to be a, a value between one and a random figure. So we'll pull off of this and say random float in range. Okay, so the random float in range, uh, as I said, we'll leave this as one. So it can be either a complete cube or we're going to go up to a size of five I found worked quite well. And that's just going to give us, like I said, a little bit of randomized scaling. In the viewport, if we go back in and press compile, because this is on the construction script, uh, that will take immediate effect as soon as you press compile. And I think <laughs> uh, we can see that it just disappeared because I didn't set a minimum scale for the X and the Y, which we're just going to leave as one and one. So if we go back, hit compile again now, at the very least, we're going to get a one by one 
on the x and the y and then we've got these random values being changed on the z scale of the uh, the object and this is going to be perfectly fine this is going to allow us to very quickly and easily add the obstacles in but still have it looking kind of randomized and just making it look a little bit more interesting than just having squares or uh, perfect sized cubes appearing everywhere so next up would be to move over to the event graph we don't need any of these and we can just double check that we have the correct collision value set on the on the uh, the static mesh and remember we're not blocking anything in this game uh, at the moment we're just doing our overlap check so we're going to change this to overlap all and then that will allow us to interact with the um the player and things but not move things around or cause kind of uh, wall style interaction or blocking so if we come down here we can now go to the on component begin overlap and we're just going to do our logic and functionality for when we hit the player. So the first thing we want to do, the obstacles should only really be interacting or checking for the player. The level manager, remember, is checking for all objects which hit the level manager or the level bounding box. So we don't need to take that into account in this class. So the only thing this class should be worried about hitting will be the player. So we're going to do a cast to BP underscore player base. And remember, we're looking for the player base class. Uh, again, if you've started expanding your classes outside of the uh, stuff taught here, then by casting to the base class of the player system, that means that it will then account for any type of inherited player that you've made. Now, if we have hit the player, then we want to send a notification to the player class. And this is going to be a function that we don't yet have. So I'm just going to very quickly go to our player class. And I'm going to add a function in here, which is just called hit obstacle. Now, we're not going to fill this one out at the moment. We're just going to add this as a placeholder. But that does mean that we can then at least call this here and not need to worry about coming back to the obstacle class. So with that done, we're going to pull off of the uh, successful cast to the player base. And we'll call the hit obstacle function. And then the final thing we want to do is we also want to tell the level manager that the game is over. So... I'm going to go back to the level manager as well because this one I can't remember if we have actually implemented this function. So we'll go into level manager and we'll see if we have any other events here. So we don't have this either. So I'm going to create another function again. I'm going to call this one the game over. So I'm just going to create the game over func uh, function as a placeholder. Go back to the obstacle. We're going to go and use our universal function that we've created in the library and we'll just find the get level manager. So we've got the BPF function library and uh, we can get the level manager here. Now, I thought we had this as a pure function. This should only be returning the value. So I'm just gonna double click and check this. Uh, we only have the values being returned, so we shouldn't have the execution pins. And I've, if you select the function here, it just seems that we've got to tick this as pure. So if we hit compile and save that, we should now be able to go back to our obstacle. Um, this is now a pure function, so we can just get the value straight from this. We can call the game over function that we just made and we can plug that straight in too. So that just means, like I mentioned, that we shouldn't have to worry about coming back to our obstacle class. This will now be ready to call those functions as soon as we go back to those classes and implement them. And of course, the final two things we need to do, and there's actually gonna be three because we now want to check that the classes which are already calling the uh, get level manager function probably didn't notice that before. So we just wanna make sure that the execution pins aren't not being hooked up won't be causing a problem so we'll fix that at the very end uh, but whilst we're still in the obstacle class if we go to our set parent function first of all which is of course in our interface we just want to pull off of the parent pin we're going to promote this to a variable so this is the same as we've done previously and we're going to call this one the parent reference we're going to plug the parent reference in here and we can plug this into the return or not doesn't really matter because we're not returning anything and then we're going to go to the return parent function and quite simply we're going to plug in the parent reference that we now have stored so that is really the obstacle class ready and set up to go and like i mentioned there's just going to be a few classes we want to go back over because of the uh, the change to our function library okay so after a quick look around the project it doesn't seem as anything's going to break we can press play and everything's still getting its reference uh, I did kind of forget how we'd set a few things up and because I was trying to demonstrate a couple of different ways that we can do things, I have overlooked a couple of points. So one thing that is really useful that we can do, uh, say that we wanted to find out everything that was using the BPF underscore lib class, we can right click on this and we can use the reference viewer option. Now this is going to return everything here 
which is making a call to that function library and then anything that that function library is returning or referencing itself. So of course, the only thing that it's referencing is the level manager because it's getting a reference of the current level manager in the game. And the only two things which are currently using it, which are the scrolling component and the BP underscore obstacle that we've just made. So we know that that one's working. So if we go back to our misc folder, we can find our scrolling component. And in here, we can see that we actually already had that set up correctly with the branch check. If we can find the level manager, then we're doing the uh, reference setting. And that did make me realize that the player should probably have a reference to the level manager as well. Um, and it, it's currently using the other option, which is the macro library, which we will be using, but to try and keep things tidy, we're going to set the player to use the same blueprint function library as everything else. So to do that, it's going to be very quick. Make a quick copy of the get level manager and the branch check here. And in fact, we probably should have done the branch check in the obstacle as well. So if we just quickly go back over to our obstacle class, this is a little bit unsafe on the event begin play because we're just setting a reference or calling a function on a reference that we may not have. So before we do that, if we just paste this in, we're going to plug in the branch check here. And then only if the branch check is successful, so if we do actually have a level manager in the, uh, in the world, then we will call that function on that class. Now, this is like I've mentioned previously, this is a very, very simple set of uh, tutorials in this series. So we kind of already know that we have one level and we're always going to have a level manager there. But the ideal thing would be to pull off here, do a print string, do some debug logging to kind of bring to attention if someone's creating levels and they haven't got a level manager, that, that needs to be addressed. But we're not going to go into depth of that because, again, uh, this is really just a safety precaution and it's going to help on bigger projects rather than this type of project. But back in the Blueprints folder, we've got the pawn base class. Now we can see, like I mentioned here, we've got a reference to on the initialize function, if you're not already brought in here. Uh, we're using the macro library. Now we will still need this for the project, but uh, that was really just an example earlier. Like I said, we're going to try and stick to using our get level manager. So if we pull this off again, we're going to do the, the branch to make sure that this exists. If it does exist, then we're going to plug that in and create our reference to the level manager this way. Um, and because we already have this, if not, then we're just going to do the same thing again. We're going to print string saying that there's no level manager found. That means we can get rid of the macro and we can just tidy this up and move these things around here. So pretty much exactly the same thing's happening. Uh, it's just going to make things a little bit easier. Basically, the macro library is something we're going to need later for certain classes where you cannot use or reference the function library. But generally, for everything which can use the function library, I'm going to try and keep that as the default approach. Um, and that just means now that if we go back into our library folder, find the function library and do our reference viewer, again, it's going to make it much easier <laughs> if we update this and let it know, uh, then it's going to make it much easier to keep track of what is using it uh, if we ever needed to do anything like that to check for broken links and things. Okay, so that is the project kind of tidied up at the moment. Nothing really has changed again if we press play. Nothing's really changed at this stage. The obstacle spawner is going to be its own topic and that will be in the next video. So I'm going to leave that one here for today. As always, if you enjoyed these videos or find them useful, please do leave a like and share the video around, that always helps. And of course, don't forget to hit the subscribe button to be kept up to date with any of the content coming from any of the playlists on the channel. And as ever, thanks for watching, and I will see you all next time.